The Little Prince, Chapter 4 I had thus learned a second fact of great importance. This was that the planet the little prince came from was scarcely any larger than a house. But that did not really surprise me much. I knew very well that in addition to the great planets, such as Earth, Jupiter, Mars, Venus, to which we have given names, there are also hundreds of others, some of which are so small that one has a hard time seeing them through a telescope. When an astronomer discovers one of these, he does not give it a name, but only a number. He might call it, for example, Asteroid 325. I have serious reason to believe that the planet from which the little prince came is the asteroid known as B612. The asteroid has only been once seen through a telescope. That was by a Turkish astronomer in 1909. On making his discovery, the astronomer had presented it to the International Astronomical Congress in a great demonstration. But he was in Turkish costume, and so nobody will believe what he said. Grown-ups are like that. Fortunately, however, for the reputation of asteroid B612, a Turkish dictator made a law that his subjects, under pain of death, should change to European costume. So, in 1920, the astronomer gave his demonstration all over again, dressed with impressive style and elegance, and this time everybody accepted his report. If I have told you these details about the asteroid and made a note of its number for you, it is on account of the grown-ups and their ways. When you tell them that you have made a new friend, they never ask you any questions about essential matters. They never say to you, what does his voice sound like? What game does he love best? Does he collect butterflies? Instead, they demand, how old is he? How many brothers has he? How much does he weigh? How much money does his father make? Only from these figures do they think that they have learned anything about him. If you were to say to the grown-ups, I saw a beautiful house made of rosy brick with geraniums in the windows and doves on the roof, they would not be able to get any idea of that house at all. You will have to say to them, I saw a house that cost 20,000. Then they will exclaim, Oh, what a pretty house that is. Just so, you might say to them, The proof that the little prince existed is that he was charming, that he laughed, that he was looking for a sheep. If anybody wants a sheep, that is a proof that he exists. And what good will it do to tell them that? They will shrug their shoulders and treat you like a child. But if you said to them, the planet he came from is asteroid B612, then they will be convinced and leave you in peace from their questions. They are like that. One must not hold it against them. Children should always show great forbearance toward grown-up people. But certainly, for us who understand life, figures are a matter of indifference. I should have liked to begin this story in the fashion of the fairy tales. I should have liked to say, once upon a time, there was a little prince who lived on a planet that was scarcely any bigger than himself and who had need of a sheep. To those who understand life, that would have given a much greater air of truth to my story. For I do not want anyone to read my book carelessly. I have suffered too much grief in setting down these memories. Six years 
have already passed since my friend went away from me with his ship. If I try to describe him here, it is to make sure that I shall not forget him. To forget a friend is sad. Not everyone has had a friend, and if I forget him, I may become like a grown-ups who are no longer interested in anything but figures. It is for that purpose, again, that I have bought a box of paints and some pencils. It is hard to take up drawing again at my age, when I have never made any pictures except those of the Bois Constrictor from the outside and the Bois Constrictor from the inside since I was six. I shall certainly try to make my portraits as true to life as possible, but I'm not at all sure of success. One drawing goes along all right, and another has no resemblance to its subject. I make some errors too. In the little prince's height, in one place he is too tall, and in another too short, and I feel some doubts about the color of his costume. So I fumble along as best I can. Now good, now bad, and I hope generally fair to middling. In certain more important details, I shall make mistakes also. But it is something that will not be my fault. My friend never explained anything to me. He thought, perhaps, that I was like himself. But I, alas, do not know how to see sheep through the walls of boxes. Perhaps I am a little like the grown-ups. I have had to grow old. Thanks for listening.